Okay, our next project is going to be digital painting, right? And all I ask on the assignment sheet is that you pick some simple photo reference, ideally more than just one photo reference, of an animal, you know, from, from head to tail, like the whole thing, or uh, some sort of portrait. I say a celebrity caricature, just because there's a lot of celebrities photos online that you could use. But if you wanted to do, you know, a self-portrait, a portrait of a, a family member, someone that you don't think would be too uh, overly weirded out to have art made of them, feel free to do that. And so a portrait you can just do from the heads up, the head up. You don't need to, to worry about trying to do the whole body. That's a whole other set of skills. And there are some different ways to, to make digital paintings, for sure. But what I'm going to teach you is a method like it says on the assignment sheet where we sketch some basic shapes and we build up the painting on those shapes. So that's how it's very different than a digital coloring. We are not making line art that we are then coloring behind, right? Instead, we're building this up on top of basic shapes, basic marks. And we can look at a lot of different reference images, but we are not compositing with them. You know, we are not building from other people's pixels. We're creating our own pixels for this digital painting. This takes a lot of uh, digital processing because we're just making a lot of, of our own unique pixels, right? And having control of them. And because of that, we get to stylize it any way you want. So I say under tips, this is not a, a project where you're trying to be photorealistic, unless that's what, you're, what you want to try to do. So you can be cartoony, you can be psychedelic, drippy, you can be um, trying to imitate uh, a certain type of printmaking, a certain type of uh, oil pastel, a certain artist that you like, you can try to emulate their style. We're gonna find the ways that you can customize your own digital painting approach. And you can also even blend your portraits with animals if you like. Students have asked that in the past. That's just a way of stylizing something. So whatever your idea of, of a caricature or portrait is, you are allowed to explore with this project. Okay, so what I'm going to do is something a little in between. It's not an animal. It's not a portrait. I am going to do an image of my own digital painting of a Godzilla mask because this is a mask we actually own. So I found some digital images of it, right? It's good to have multiple reference because notice how even the same mask based on how it's photographed from the angle, from how close the lens is, from the depth of field and from the coloring of it, right? Based on the lighting of the room it was photographed in, Look how different they can be. And then also these masks are hand painted. So the eyes are different sizes on each one of them, right? And the gums are differently painted. Mine looks kind of more like this with black gums here, but the green looks a lot more like this, you know? So I'm gonna use these two references to come up with my own painting portrait of, of this Godzilla head. Okay, so how do I get started? Well, I'm not going to do what we've done for compositing projects. I'm not gonna open up one of these uh, found digital images and then work with it. Instead, I'm gonna create something from scratch in PhotoP. And you can do this in Photoshop as well. This is digital painting is a raster art form. It is pixel based. So I'm gonna say new project or file new in Photoshop. And then I want it to be large enough to print and high quality. So I'm going to do uh, at least eight by 10 inches by 350 pixels per inch. So I'm actually gonna do a little bit more than that, see if my computer can take it. I'm gonna do um, 11 inches wide by 14 inches tall at 350 pixels per inch. I know it says DPI, but it's pixels per inch with a white background. So I create that. 
Now I have that that distancing markers, you know, turned on. I'm going to turn those off just so those don't distract right now. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to say file open in place. And I'm going to bring in those digital images, those reference images into my workspace. This is just like preparing your canvas and then uh, tacking up the photos that you are referencing before you start painting around your easel or around your desk. So I can just drag and drop them in to move them up above my background. And notice that these are low resolution images. So I wouldn't want to composite with those anyway, because they wouldn't be high quality when they print. Get the next one. Build it up. Now, we studied compositing so that we know how we can manipulate these, just these references, so that they're a good resource for us to look at. So I'm going to flip this so that they're both facing the same way. And just so they're a little bit more visible, even though it softens them up, I am going to enlarge them. And if you want to, whoops, let's redo that. Especially if you're doing a caricature, you can use what you know about compositing to play with your photo reference, meaning you can stretch it out. This is one reason I'm using Godzilla, because everyone has their own different version of Godzilla. You can kind of nip and tuck it. You can play with distorting it, right? This is all part of the creative process. And it's the kind of thing a traditional painter would do as well. We're not a slave to the photograph. We're going to be making all of our own marks, right? And that's why it's nice to have more than one reference so you're not just trying to always match one thing. Okay, so I just stretched them out a little bit, played with them a little bit. Okay, this is my working space. And I have a blank white background that I want to label and I wanna keep it locked so that I can't accidentally paint on the white background, right? It will be locked. Then I have my references. And so that I don't mess up and ac ac accidentally paint on my references, I'm going to put them in a folder. And I'm going to lock that folder. Right? So I also can't paint on those reference files. Right? Instead, I create new layers on top. And these are what I'm going to paint with. So. There's a bunch of methods for digital painting. One method is called rotoscoping, and I've demoed this. You can look at those videos on the YouTube channel. But rotoscoping would be that I take the reference, I make it the size I want, I dim it down, kind of like I was tracing a sketch, and I just digitally paint right on top of the image. right? But of course, the downside of that is it still a lot of work? I'm still making all my own pixels with my own brush strokes, but I'm never going to deviate at all from the exact photo reference. And so all the flaws of the photo reference are the flaws of my painting. So rotoscoping is a really kind of technical, but kind of dead way of doing it. It's pretty similar to the way these portrait. So the way a portrait generator works and this is Portrait AI app, just a free online portrait generator, is I can take my image and I have to pick one, right? I'm gonna pick the one that, come on. 
that looks the most like a regular selfie, right? And then what it does is it samples from a lot of historical art examples, like mostly uh, Victorian paintings of white women and steals aspects from it like lips, right? <laughs> and it kind of tries to replace pixels with pixels. And some of them get closer and some of them get, you know, further away. This at least has the eyes and the teeth and the mouth, but it's just all mapped on the photo. So there's more to painting than just, you know, tracing the image with different colors. So rotoscoping is limited that way. So instead, we're going to treat this pretty traditional. We're going to build it with what's called speed painting. And we're just going to quickly kind of sketch it in like we would with acrylic or oil paint. That's how I'm going to demo it this semester. So to do that, I'm going to make a, a new blank layer that I call my sketch layer. And I'm going to start with a brush. Now, whatever the default brush is in PhotoP, and I'm just using a trackpad in PhotoP, right? It's a gray color, at least on mine right now. It's um, a normal brush. It just is a, a normal round 15 pixel wide brush at 100% hardness. The opacity is 100%. The smoothness is 0%, you know, so it's gonna capture every jitter that I have. And if I use a tablet, it's set to be pressure sensitive, but I'm not using a tablet, I'm just using a trackpad. So the first thing we need to do, just like if you were painting on a canvas or on a piece of watercolor paper, is choose our brush. So digitally, we customize it. We use the tool options here. And instead of using a, a perfectly round brush, you can see the, the defaults. There's not a whole lot of options, but there are some. And you can see that there's a messier brush option here. If I make it nice and big, you can see what that looks like. So if I zoom in, this brush, instead of being just a perfect round, is kind of an irregular shape and it's a little bit cloudy. So if I use a different color than gray, it will be kind of a cloudy version of that. And then you see how the edges are slightly already um, not so opaque. So now the gray and the red are mixing, even though I'm painting at 100% opacity at 100% flow. And the hardness you'll see is grayed out. So all I did was change it from a default brush, which is just a hard circle, to one of their other preset brushes, which is this one, which is 76 pixels wide, but I can make it bigger so you can see. And that will already kind of naturally blend with other things. So if I pick another color, you can start to get a sense of how this can start to look like paint instead of just hard-edged pixels. You That's... dropped your opacity, right? No, my opacity is at 100. My flow's at 100. So the opacity at the edge is built into the brush, into the brush option. So here's another one. This one's more like an airbrush. So that's at 100. 100% 100 opacity, 100% flow but it's all scattered. So when I use it, it has some slightly soft edges and you can see how those colors start to mix together. How come your colors are grayed out and mine are really vivid? It depends what color you select in your foreground color selector. So if I pick the most saturated blue I can, you know, in this upper right hand corner, then I will paint with a really saturated blue. If I pick a really saturated red in the upper right-hand corner, it will paint with that really saturated